let's just dive right in. My name is Travis. <laughs> Actually, Travis Snyder that was up here was just, he was standing right here. He was my, my college roommate, my freshman roommate at CSU, which made for some confusion because Travis and Travis, um, both from Evergreen, Colorado, um, was confusing when people would call us. I'd like to talk to Travis. Well, the one from Evergreen, well, we both are. You know our last names? So anyway, we're going to start a new series today. We're heading into Christmas, and our series is called Foretold. We're going to talk about prophecy. I think the, the reality here is that we understand as we study the Bible that all the plot lines in the Bible, all the stories, all the narratives, they converge on one person, and that's Jesus Christ. It's not that Jesus is in, in every single paragraph or every single chapter, um, but he's hinted at. He's the theme of the whole thing. And I kind of think about that, like there's movies where at the very end there's a big reveal, and it suddenly makes sense of the whole thing. Like that movie, The Sixth Sense, if you've seen that, it's an older movie, so I think I can give away the uh, ending at this point. Is that okay? He's dead the whole time. What? <laughs> Sorry, Steve. I didn't want to spoil it for you, but Bruce Willis is dead the whole time. And so the first time through the movie, you don't know that. But the second time through the movie, it's kind of like the anti-gospel. The hero is actually dead. Our hero is actually alive, revealed at the end. But once you know the ending, you can see the earlier parts of the movie. And so there's like this scene where he's in the room with this woman. And, and you think they were talking to each other the first time you saw it. But you go back and you realize she can't see him because he's dead. They're not actually talking to each other. And you can't not see it now that you know how the story ends. Third time through, that movie's not very good but it is kind of fascinating the second time to see all of those little pieces come together. Now, when we look at the story found in Scripture in the Bible, we call this foretelling or prophecy. It's provable that the Old Testament, the writings of the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, were written hundreds of years before the historical Jesus walked on planet Earth. And that had all been assembled, documented, and accepted as the words of God by the Jewish people at the time when Jesus showed up on planet Earth. Did you know, if you examine the Bible closely, around just about 27% of it is prophecy? That's a pretty high percentage. About 300 of those prophecies specifically relate to Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah who would save the people from their sins. Messiah in Hebrew literally means the anointed one. It's like when the ancient Israelites, they would anoint a priest or a king, sometimes a prophet, as they came into office. And it's foretelling this figure, this anointed one who would come and be the king and save his people. The New Testament corresponding word to that is Christos, where we get Christ from. I don't know if you knew Christ isn't actually Jesus' last name. It's his title. Jesus, the savior, the liberator of his people, the anointed king. That's what Christ is. Is. And so the writers of the Old Testament, they wrote, they were inspired by God. Sometimes they didn't even understand what they were writing as they wrote it. And the word Messiah itself isn't even in the Old Testament a lot, but there's this figure that keeps appearing over and over and over and over again. This figure emerges when you read all of the prophecies. The Apostle Peter in the New Testament, he said in 1 Peter 1.10 that the prophets wrote concerning the coming of Christ. They looked at what they wrote and they tried to figure out who this figure was, this person they were talking about, and when all of these things were going to come to pass and this mysterious figure started emerging... And he was referred to by a lot of things in the prophecies as they foretold his coming. The suffering servant, the prophet, 
the son of David, the coming world ruler, the anointed one, one individual who ultimately, we believe, becomes the person of Jesus Christ. And so by the time Jesus showed up, about 2,000 years ago, the Jews had been referring to this individual in their own scriptures, in their prophecies, as the coming Messiah. And yet when he showed up, most of them didn't recognize him when he came. Even the disciples missed it. So we've been studying the book of John. We came to a conclusion on that a couple of weeks ago. Towards the end, remember, there were these various scenes where Jesus is revealing who he is to his disciples as they realize he actually really came back from the dead and he's bodily standing in front of them. In Luke 24, he appears to two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus and they had missed it. They had missed his coming. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe that all, all that the prophets have spoken, all the Jewish people at this time, they had spent their whole lives immersed in these scriptures, in these prophecies. They had memorized large portions of it. Some of them had memorized all of it. This was their schooling. This was everything. They were immersed in it. And yet these men had missed him. In it, And he says, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that these prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, that's Genesis, beginning with Moses and the prophets, that's all the way through Malachi. He interpreted to them all the scriptures, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And so he looked at each passage and he said, that was me, that was me, that's me, that's me. The plan from the beginning was me. And it says a few verses later, these two disciples, after Jesus vanished and went somewhere else, they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Something was starting to change in them as they came to believe. A few verses later, Jesus shows up to the rest of his disciples then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, that's Genesis through Deuteronomy, and the prophets, it's most of the rest of the Old Testament, the Psalms, it must be fulfilled, he says to them. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He opened their minds to understand what was foretold. I wonder what that Bible study was like. Did he just do it all in an instant where they just absorbed it like in the Matrix where you plug in and then you have all the information? I'm making these movie references that are just way too old for you guys in the front row. <laughs> Couple of you got it. Yeah, you're, okay, you're good. Okay, so I don't know how he organized it. I mean, but we want to do that this Christmas season just a little bit because there's a lot of prophecies we could go into and I would encourage you to really sit down and study it. But that's basically what we're going to do. We're going to look at Genesis through Malachi. And we're going to look at various passages that point <laughs> to this figure, this Messiah. And then we're going to just kind of expand on that and how that culminates and is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to dive into it in a couple of coming weeks. We could go a lot of different directions with this. We're going to try to split it into some categories. So a category... Potentially, it could be the covenant storyline of Scripture from Genesis. It's fulfillment, how God promised early on in Genesis that all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through the line of Abraham, through the seed, through the offspring, that a new covenant would be made. Uh, we're going to look at God with us, Emmanuel. This is a very Christmassy terminology, the nature, the ancestry of Christ, his birthplace, how it was predicted, his humanity, his life on earth. Then we're going to talk about this anointed king, the Messiah. He's going to reign. He, the government will be on his shoulders. There's going to be kings who fall before him. And then we're going to talk about future promises because there's promises about this Messiah that have yet to be fulfilled that we believe are coming. There's going to be a gathering of all people to himself. There's going to be a future eternal kingdom, a kingdom that has no end, and we're going to look at those things. Today, I just want to kind of give an overview about this Messiah that was promised, show how clearly the Old Testament predicts Jesus, 
and then conclude with just talking just a little bit about what are the odds that somebody could just randomly fulfill all of these Old Testament prophecies. But let's pray. Jesus, we believe that you are God, you are the Messiah, you are the promised ones. One, one, the, the one that all the prophets predicted. God, help us as we go through the Christmas season to not miss that. I, I appreciate what Steve shared with us, that sometimes we can wrap Christmas in this kind of sanitized niceness and miss what really needed to happen. That though humans fell and rebelled against God, God had a plan from the beginning that there would be a rescue in the person of Jesus. Help us to see that clearly, Jesus. Thank you for being present with us. Thank you that you're alive here and your spirit dwells in each one of us. Open our hearts and our minds like those disciples on the road to Emmaus and those in the upper room as Jesus appeared to them and helped them to understand. I pray that our hearts, just like theirs, would burn within us about you. So we lift all this up in your name, Jesus. Amen. So imagine Jesus being there with his disciples and doing this Bible study and opening their minds and their hearts and explaining everything. I imagine him going all the way back to the beginning and he could potentially have said something like, hey, in the beginning I was there in the Garden of Eden with my father. We made it all. It was incredible and yet death and sin entered into the world as humanity turned their back on us. But even before that had happened, we had a plan. And I wonder if he went to Genesis 3. And I wonder if he read them this verse. Where God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is to the serpent who had deceived Eve. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And I wonder if Jesus said, this is the first gospel. This is the proto-gospel that shows that we always had a plan for salvation from the very, very beginning. We had that plan as soon as sin entered the world. We had already thought of it, and it was going to happen. And so very, very, very early on in Genesis, we see that there's going to be this offspring from Eve. We see that it's going to be a male. It's pretty broad. Probably anybody could come along who's male and fulfill that at some point, theoretically. So the odds of fulfilling this particular prophecy are pretty good. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, so we're going to have to narrow it down a little bit. Genesis 22, this is God talking to Abraham. And um, this is uh, where he was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. And you remember God provided a substitute for that sacrifice, the ram. The real test was whether or not Abraham would be willing to sacrifice his son. And he says in the verse right before this, he says, Because you've done this and not withheld your son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. All the people of earth, the offspring of Genesis 3, Eve's offspring, this male figure is going to be carried into one person's descendants. That's Abraham. And specifically in a verse right before this, uh, he mentions that seed coming through Abraham's son Isaac. So it's Eve, then Abraham, then Isaac, a descendants. Let's narrow it further. Numbers 24, 17 narrows it down. This is from Balaam. He's actually a guy outside of Israel. He was hired to curse Israel. Um, he, he told the king that had hired him, though, he said, hey, you know what, I'm only going to speak what God tells me. And he ends up blessing Israel a whole bunch of times. And in the middle of that blessing, he says this. He says, I see him. I see him. But not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So Jacob is Israel's son. He's going to come out of Jacob, and he's going to have a scepter. Interesting. You know, when Jacob got his sons together and, and he decided to bless them, he paused at Judah. And he said this in Genesis 49.10. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs 
shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. And so this mysterious figure first promised in Genesis 3, we now have narrowed down to a descendant of Judah, someone who's worthy of holding the scepter, meaning he's from the kingly line of Judah. And then we have a potential timeline. We have a potential time, and the one who would come would come before the scepter departs from Judah. So if you study world history, the scepter departed from Judah in A.D. 70. Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. Genealogical records are destroyed. There's no longer any way to track who's coming from Judah, except by word of mouth, maybe. When Jesus showed up on this planet, he knew his genealogy because every Jew knew their genealogy. After A.D. 70, no Jew formally knew their genealogy anymore. And so after A.D. 70, it'd be pretty hard to fulfill this prophecy because you couldn't be definitive as to whether or not this ruler truly was worthy of being called someone from the line of Judah of the kingly class. So before A.D. 70 is our timeline. He's got to come before that. It narrows it down a little bit further. So the genealogy is starting to get referred to here. And I think we can probably use that to narrow it down a little bit further in the book of Isaiah. It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This branch concept is a very important concept in Jewish theology as they study where this Messiah is coming from, the branch coming from Jesse or a rod from Jesse, depending on which translation you're reading. That's an important one in Messianic theology. And so Jesse is revealed at the end of the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Ruth is David, King David's great-grandmother. Her son is Obed. Obed's son is Jesse. Jesse is the father of King David. The genealogy of this particular individual is referred to so much in the Old Testament, this shoot that comes from, or this branch that comes from Jesse. He's referred to as the son of David. David himself, when he's king, he gets a prophecy. That prophecy in 2 Samuel 7.16 says, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God foretold to David himself that there would be one from David's genealogy, from David's house, one of his descendants who would reign forever on David's throne. And we can narrow that down. Who specifically is that going to be? Isaiah 9, 6 says, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. I'm just giving a big broad overview. There's a whole bunch of other passages mixed in with all of these things. Hopefully we'll be able to dive into a little bit more. Just scratching the surface. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government shall be on his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You guys recognize that? We sing that every Christmas season. This is a prophecy about the coming Messiah, who this is going to be. He's going to be a child born, a son given, but the government will be on his shoulders. He's going to rule. Uh, and then the next verse says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So there's going to be a single eternal ruler from the line of David who's going to inherit the kingdom. He'll be king forever. His kingdom will increase until it covers the entire planet. This is not just going to be for the Jews. It's going to be for the Gentiles, for everyone to the ends of the world. Jeremiah 23 affirms this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, here's the branch again, a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness, the righteous branch, the branch, the shoot from Jesse. He's going to become our righteousness. That, that's kind of a foretelling of our New Testament Christian theology, right? That one would come and become our righteousness. So in the line of David, if you look ahead at the book of Revelation, in Revelation 3-7, it refers to one who holds the key of David. And it says that this is basically, this is the rightful owner of David's throne. He holds the key, this coming one. 
And it says he's going to open a door to heaven that no one can ever shut. Sounds like Jesus. So a king will come, descended from David. He's going to come before AD 70. And this is locked into the Jewish people's minds because they had memorized all this scripture even before Jesus had come. The son of David was vivid in those, ma- those people's minds. Jesus himself in Matthew 24, or Matthew 22, 41 and 42, he asks the Pharisees, who is the Christ? Remember, that's the Greek term for the Messiah, so they know who he's asking about. Who's this anointed one? Who's the one foretold in your scriptures? And they responded that he would be the son of David. That's their expectation. The genealogy of Jesus sets this up because Jesus himself was descended from David. Both the one in Matthew, which records Joseph, his adopted father's genealogy, and the one in Luke, which records Mary's genealogy, and both of them go back to common ancestry within the tribe of Judah with a common ancestor of King David. And so Christ is going to come, the Messiah is going to come from David. He'd need to come before the scepter departed from Judah, which ultimately happened in AD 70. So Jesus himself is within the timeline of that prophecy. And just as an aside, if you have some time at some point to dive deep onto something interesting, study Daniel 9 and his 70 weeks. It references the time period the Messiah is going to show up. It's really, really interesting. It actually predicts, in my opinion, the day of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. And even alternate interpretations of the 70 weeks of Daniel land the timeline within the lifetime of Jesus as he lived on this earth. And I'm, so, I'm sitting here imagining Jesus unpacking all of these scriptures one at a time for his, his disciples. I bet he emphasized Psalm, 23, Psalm 22. I bet he emphasized Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53 because there's so many detailed specifics about himself, about the Messiah, like his death, he was going to die. His death would be public for all people to see it. It wasn't going to be something that's done in secret. There's going to be crowds who will come against him. It's going to be a judicial execution. It's going to come from the court, uh, the law. Uh, It'll be for the sins of others and not his own sins. This is all in Psalm 22, and it's in Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. He's not going to open his mouth and defend himself. I bet he looked at his disciples and said, you guys were there, Peter, John, you heard me. Well, he didn't hear me because I didn't respond. <laughs> they asked who I was. I didn't respond. He won't open his mouth to defend himself. He'll be stretched out, stretched out. His bones won't be broken. Remember the fulfillment of that. He'll point out that the thieves on either side of him, they hadn't died yet when those soldiers came along. And so they broke the bones in their legs so that they would die from suffocation. But they came to Jesus to do the same thing. And he had already died. Remember that. So his bones wouldn't be broken. He'd be dehydrated. His hands and feet would be pierced. He'll be buried in a rich man's tomb. He reminds them of all of these things and they see clearly this all happened to you, Jesus. Such detailed accounts and he might remind them this all was written hundreds and hundreds of years before he ever walked on this planet. You know, his resurrection was prophesied in these chapters as well. And later in Acts 2, we see the Apostle Peter before the Jews uh, quoting David's prophecy in Psalm 16. And he says this in Acts 2, he's quoting Psalm 16, 9 through 10. He says, therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. And he says, you know, David wrote this. And theoretically, like he he would have been writing about himself, right? But actually it was a prophecy because we all know, Peter said this in Acts 2, he said, we all know that David died and was buried, so this couldn't possibly have been about him. It was about Jesus, who would not end up seeing the realm of the dead. His His body would not see decay, and Peter uses it as a proof that the Messiah had raised from the dead. And we're all witnesses of it. I'm imagining Jesus reminding them that they all know his mother, Mary. They all know his mother and they know her claim that she conceived while she was a virgin. 
that Joseph was not Jesus' father, nor was any other earthly man. And he might have reminded them of that and then opened up Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The only candidate in history that I know of that has a claim to that is Jesus, at least that he claims of himself. And additionally, for those wondering, then who is the Messiah's father supposed to be? Maybe he opened this up. Proverbs 30, verse 4, who has ascended to heaven and come down, who has gathered the wind in his fists, who has wrapped up the waters in a garment. He's talking about God. Who has established all the ends of the earth. What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Indicating that God has a son. The son of God showing up in the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs, written hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born. So we also know where he'll be born. The Old Testament foretells this as well. But to you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me the one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Meaning, Genesis 3, God said, there's going to be a coming one, a descendant of Eve, who will eventually crush the head of the serpent. His coming forth is foretold from old, from ancient days. There's two Bethlehems, so they have to be specific. I love that Old Testament prophecy is specific. It's not, it's not vague. It's not generalized. Bethlehem, Ephrathah, that specific Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. One thing to consider about this, the Jews at the time... They knew this. They had memorized this. They had studied this. Remember when Jesus' family fled to Egypt, the wise men came and the angel showed up and told the wise men, no, don't go back to Herod. Don't tell him. He's going to do harm to Jesus. So they go another way. Herod realizes this has happened and he assembles these, these Jews around him and he asks them, hey, written in your scriptures, in the scriptures, where does it say the king of the Jews is going to be born, this Messiah, this anointed one? And they say, clearly, it says Bethlehem Ephrathah. And so remember the story, he sends an army over there to kill every boy two years age or younger, but Jesus has already fled to Egypt. So they knew, they had already seen it, they had already read into it, and yet they didn't see clearly that this Jesus was actually the one, even though they clearly saw the foretelling enough to be able to tell the king and that king take a horrible action. Speaking of Herod killing those babies, Matthew 2, 17 through 18, calls that killing a fulfillment of the prophecy in Jeremiah 31, 15. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentations and and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. And speaking of Jesus' family escaping to Egypt, Matthew 2 says that fulfills the prophecy in Hosea 11.1, 1, which says, Out of Egypt I called my son. So a descendant from David in the specific town of Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' arrival, who would then go to Egypt and come out of Egypt. And there are others like the prediction of a messenger that would come before Jesus and prepare the way for him. In Malachi 3.1 it says, Prepare the way. This was fulfilled in the person of John the Baptist who traveled around saying, Jesus is the Messiah, he's coming. A really compelling one is in Zechariah 9.9. Jesus might have opened it up and said, hey guys, remember I sent two of you guys to go in that next town and and pick up a donkey for me? Remember you were all freaked out because you didn't have any money to buy the donkey? And I said, just when they ask you, just say, the Lord needs the donkey and they'll give it to you. Remember you guys went and did that and you came back with this donkey and... And they're like, yeah, we remember that. That was really weird, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's like, well, read this. Remember that it was written over 500 years ago and see if it sounds familiar. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation as he humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The The Messiah would come specifically come into Jerusalem He'd be born in Bethlehem, a descendant of David, at the time that Jesus does this, and that's exactly what he did. He rode into Jerusalem exactly on the day that was predicted. And the Jews knew this passage. They knew exactly who he was when he came in. They quoted Psalm 118. 
Hosanna, blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord. They neglected the other part of Psalm 118 that said the cornerstone is going to be rejected. And ultimately they did reject him. But that's why the Pharisees asked Jesus to tell his disciples to be quiet on that Palm Sunday because they were declaring him king. And this belief was firm in the Jewish mind, so firm in the Talmud, which is written several hundred years later, the, the rabbis talking about this messianic property, they said, if anyone saw, they used the other word for donkey, which I won't repeat right now, a donkey in his dream, even in his dream, he's going to see salvation. They knew it was the Messiah coming in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. Other verses say that this Messiah is going to perform miracles. Isaiah 35, 5 through 6 talks about the eyes of the blind being open, the ears of the deaf being unstopped, the lame walking like a deer, the, the tongue that's mute singing for joy. And you know, Jesus did these things. He did miracles. This Messiah is going to have to do that. But he also was rejected. Remember in Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Isaiah 53, he was rejected by his own people, despised. They, they, they were not attracted to him. He'll be rejected. He'll be betrayed by a friend. Now this one probably was still stinging to the disciples because Judas had been their buddy for years. And he had just betrayed Jesus and he had just gone out and hung himself. We said, hey, let's pull up Zechariah 10. And I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Now, this is written hundreds of years before this actually happened. It was well accepted that this had been written. It's kind of hard to discern what in the world is going on. You're going to take 30 pieces of silver. The price at which I was priced by them, says the Lord. So the Lord's price was 30 pieces of silver. You're going to take that 30 pieces of silver and throw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Like, is there a potter in the house of the Lord? Like, just imagine being a Jew back then, reading this, and be like, I don't know what this means. It gives a glimpse into what maybe we should be thinking as we read the book of Revelation and sometimes things don't make sense. At some point, it's actually going to make a lot of sense. You'll see it clearly. <sighs> Talk about detail, though. Jesus must have unpacked this for them because Judas, one of the disciples, betrayed Jesus. The price of God was 30 pieces of silver. He betrayed him, got paid 30 pieces of silver. He betrayed Afterwards, he, he feels guilty. In Matthew 27, the account is there. Verses 2 through 10. He feels guilty. He goes back. He says, I can't take this money. I, mean, I, I can't do it. I'm giving it back. And they say, we can't take it. It's blood money. The hypocrites. So he throws it into the temple. He throws it on the ground in the house of the Lord. They say, we, we can't take this money. It's blood money. Then Judas, Judas goes off and hangs himself. We read that Matthew 27 in Acts 1. We read that he busts open, like, so maybe he hanged himself and then was hanging there for a time. Eventually, maybe decay got to it. He fell down. It's really, really gross. Got bloated or something, and his guts went out on the ground in this field. And so where he hangs himself is this defiled location. And it happens to be the potter's field. And they use that money to buy the potter's field. And in Matthew 27, it says that they let people bury dead foreigners on that land. It's the potter's field. Bought from the money thrown into the house of the Lord. The 30 pieces of silver that were the price of the Lord. Foretold hundreds of years before specifically. So I'm just scratching the surface here. There's so much more. We can't go into any more of it. We'll just stop right there. And come back. Come back and you'll hear more and more in the upcoming weeks. So what's the likelihood? Let me just conclude with this. What's the likelihood of one man fulfilling all of this? I think anyone can make predictions. And for some reason, as Americans, we're really fascinated by people who make prophetic uh, predictions. In the 1950s, there was this woman named Jean Dixon. And uh, she made national news because she supposedly predicted JFK's assassination. In 1956, as Parade Magazine interview, she predicted that the next president would be a Democrat and that he would die in office, maybe on his sec first term, maybe on his second term, she didn't know for sure. She predicted that. So I'm just like trying to think analytically about this. 
what are the odds of that? So it's a two-party system, so the odds of a prediction that the next president's gonna be a Democrat, well, you're about 50-50-ish, maybe. If you know some politics, maybe you could even predict a little bit better than that, right? It's not, not really all that out of the ordinary. Um, how about the odds of a president dying in office? The chance of that actually, based on how many presidents had died in office since the year 1900 up to this point in the 1950s, three of them had died in office. So you're like about a 40% chance that the next one was probably going to based on the past you know, 50 years. Um, I figure maybe about a one in five chance of her prediction coming right. That's pretty good. It's pretty decent. I could see that happen. Um, but as the election got nearer in uh, 1960, she reversed her prediction and said Nixon would win. For some reason, everybody ignored that, even though she uh, had done that. <laughs> um, and she became a celebrity. She made a ton of money off of a book. She got hired as an advisor to famous people someone who could supposedly foretell the future, but just listen to this. They didn't really look at the other prophecies that she had given. She said that World War III would start in 1958. It didn't. She said Jackie Kennedy would never remarry. She did. She said the Panama Canal treaties wouldn't happen, but they did. She said cancer would be cured by 1967. It wasn't. She said the Russians would make it to the moon first. They didn't. She was hired to find this family's daughter. Um, she assured them that their daughter was alive and well. They later found the daughter dead. Uh, they hired her to help find the six-year-old boy who was lost in the mountains in Tennessee. She could not find him. And yet, when Nixon was president, he met with her and had her advise. And due to her advice, he created a whole cabinet committee on counterterrorism. When Reagan was in office, Nancy Reagan believed in astrology, and Nancy Reagan hired Gene Dixon to advise her. Despite the vast majority of the things she had predicted being wrong. Very, very low odds of that one coming right. Very, very high odds of that one coming right with JFK. She does have one prediction out there that's still hanging over us, that China and Russia will go to war sometime between 2025 and 2037. That war will be instigated, apparently, and won by China. Based on her other odds, meh. <laughs> Based on our current world, who knows. Um, a mathematician at Temple University coined the term the Gene Dixon effect, referring to the tendency of her fans to promote her few correct predictions while ignoring the larger number of incorrect ones. And he said, even a broken watch can tell time twice a day. <laughs> it's true. So comparing that to Bible prophecies, and that's something that captured our nation's attention, apparently enough to get presidents involved. Compared to Bible prophecies, there's no comparison. Consider the ones that I've listed out, and there's a whole bunch more, and we're going to see some more. And some of them, I think, like Jesus coming into Jerusalem specifically, like you could say, okay, he intentionally did that. He went out and got a donkey. He knew the day. He happened to do that intentionally. Well, there's other ones that are really, really hard to manipulate, like the place of your birth. That's pretty tough. So in his book, Science Speaks, a guy named Peter Stoner, he was a mathematician, a math professor, the dean of math at his university. He calculates the probability of one man fulfilling the messianic prophecies found in the Old Testament, got his students involved in the process. Um, I'm not really a math guy, but I did look this up and it's verified by the American Scientific Affiliation. They found his math to be dependable and accurate in regard to scientific material that he presented. So, using the modern science of prob probability, basically, examined by um, the chances. So he, he, he takes eight of the prophecies, just eight. And he, he says, what are the chances of these being fulfilled by any one person, just on the planet? So for example, how many people would enter into Jerusalem on a donkey proclaiming themselves to be king? And so he was really generous with this. He said, maybe one in a hundred people did this at the time. I think he's pretty generous. And he calculated out that to have eight fulfilled prophecies by one person, the chances are one to tenth to the seventeenth power. That's this number. One hundred quadrillion. 
So zeros don't make a lot of sense to me. When I look at a number, I'm like, okay, that's just a number. So he had this illustration in his book, and he said, actually, let me just put this into real terms for you. So this, the state of Texas, 268,820 square miles. It takes two days to drive through at it at you know, 80 miles an hour or whatever you do down in Texas. <laughs> if you were to take a silver dollar and mark it with a Sharpie and then take a whole bunch of other this many silver dollars, and lay them out across the entire ground of the state of Texas. You'd have to pile them two feet thick across all those 200 and, what is it, 268,820 square miles, and then take your one silver dollar and just bury it somewhere in the middle of all of that in the state of Texas. Blindfold a guy, send him out into Texas, and he can pick one dollar and come back with it. One in 10 to the 17th power is the odds of that man picking that one marked silver dollar. And that's just eight fulfilled prophecies. It's just eight. 16 fulfilled prophecies, it would be one to 10 to the 45th power. For 48 fulfilled prophecies, one in 10 to the 157th power. I had to look that number up because it was, it's a pretty huge number. 10 unquin quadrantillion. <laughs> can't comprehend it. So instead of silver dollars he used in his book, he used electrons. These are really super, super tiny. So the size of an electron, if you eliminate all the space between a line of electrons, line them up all one right after another in a single file, you're going to have a lot of electrons. Ten, uh, uh, I don't even know how to, how to describe the number. Basically he said that if you're going to count, if you could count 250 electrons every minute, you would spend 19 million years counting them. So with 10 to the 157th power, if you eliminate the space between all of the electrons, start with the Earth and zoom out 6 billion light years as a radius of a circle of these compacted electrons. He said, that's not big enough. You'd need to make 500 of those 12 billion light years across balls of electrons. You'd have to make 500 of those balls every minute for the next 6 billion years, and then you'd have enough. Then take one electron and mark it and put it out there and put a guy out in a spaceship and have him go and pick one. And that would be the chances that Jesus fulfilled 48 of these prophecies. Now, I'm not a math guy. You can go look that up yourself and figure out if that's valid or not. But I think when you study it, there's really no way to explain the Bible's ability to predict the future unless we see God as the author. It's so precise. It's not just a bunch of really good guesses. The best of our guessers are terrible. There's always, in all the guesses, there's multiple convergences and things that come together that just can't be known, they can't be controlled, and I think those prophecies can give us hope. That's my conclusion here. That from the very beginning, God always had a plan. He's always desired to be with us despite our rejection and rebellion. From the very start of that rebellion, he promised redemption. You know, it said that the disciples on the road to Emmaus, when he started unpacking these things, it said his, their hearts were burning inside of them as he, he showed himself to them in the scriptures. And I think this lit a fire in his disciples. Paul talks about in Corinthians, he talks about the veil being lifted off of the eyes of the hard-hearted Jews as they see Jesus Christ. And I think the veil is lifted off of the disciples' hearts as maybe for the first time in their lives they truly understand the, the Old Testament. I think they see Jesus alive from the dead explaining all this stuff to them and all of a sudden the words are coming alive. You know, the book of John starts off with the Apostle John saying the word became flesh. The prophecy became a person. And I think that's our hope for this series and this Christmas is that our hearts would start to burn within us. Steve, come on back up. We'd see the word become flesh, prophecy become a person, and our hearts would burn with gratitude and with joy and with hope, with enthusiasm, with energy and excitement that we'd see more of Jesus. 
and we'd see ultimately how that puts us right into this story and we get to be in it for all of eternity. What a hope. What a hope. So one little detail before Steve concludes us with a song. Um, starting December 1st, if you get our Summit Viewer emails, we're going to send out an email once a day for the Christmas season to you. And it's going to include an Old Testament prophecy and its New Testament fulfillment. Some of them might be a little bit different than that, but that's going to be the majority of them. Just real simple. We don't want to spam you. We want to encourage you. If you aren't signed up for the Summit Viewer emails, you can get on that list by going to summitviewer.com slash Christmas. I just encourage you to do that. We just like for all of us to be immersed in these prophecies for this season, that our hearts may burn within us and we might go out with joy like those disciples did.